Citroen's C5 Aircross is, according to its maker, the most comfortable SUV on the market. Quite a claim, given that this isn't a large luxury crossover, but is targeted at family buyers currently considering volume mid-size models in this class, like Ford's Cougar and Volkswagen's Tiguan. This revised version gets a more assertive look and higher equipment levels. Plus, its smarter cabin is still one of the most spacious and flexible on the market. Citroen may not have much of a history with SUVs, but over the last few years, the brand's been making up for lost time, thanks to a strong-selling crossover range launched when the little C3 Aircross was introduced back in 2017. That was followed a year later by this car, its larger stablemate, the C5 Aircross, which went on to shift 260,000 units in its original form before gaining a whole raft of mid-term update changes in early 2022 to create the car we're going to look at here. In a jam-packed market, Citroen knew from the start that the C5 Aircross would have to offer something different and for that unique selling point, turn to one of its defining brand values, ride comfort. What if, the company wondered, the cosseting way a large luxury SUV rides the bumps could be somehow replicated without expensive air suspension or adaptive damping on an affordable mid-size model? Well, to deliver that, this car has always offered clever, progressive hydraulic cushion suspension with ride comfort further embellished by super supportive advanced comfort seats. We tried and liked this combination on the original version of this car. But time moves on and in our market this Citroen was becoming increasingly overlooked in its growing segment. Hence the need for this midterm update which has smartened up the looks, added a few premium cabin touches and upgraded the infotainment system. Will it all be enough to rejuvenate C5 aircross sales in our market? Well, you'll need the usual comprehensive car and driving review to find out. The legendary Citroen 2CV had a reputation for being able to comfortably traverse a ploughed field. That apart though, this French brand can't call upon too much customer recognition when it comes to vehicles capable of functioning off the beaten track. A decade or so back, there were two rebadged Mitsubishi models, the C-Crosser and the car we didn't get, the C4 Aircross. But that was about it in terms of Citroen's history with family SUVs until this C5 Aircross first arrived. It was a crossover that back then, as now, sets out to convince you that a mid-sized model like this can provide a waftier journeying experience and not much has changed about that with this revised model. Citroen describes the experience you still get here as travelling premier class, but what exactly does that mean? Something significant surely given that this car's main selling point is a unique progressive hydraulic cushion suspension system. The name of this car might suggest this to be an air sprung setup, while the current trend might suggest it to be driver adaptive. Neither of these solutions though fits with the approach Citroen must take at this price point. The company lost money building too much damping complexity into its affordable cars in the 60s and 70s and in developing this SUV it wasn't about to make the same mistake again. So what we've got here instead is an ordinary everyday spring and damper setup that's been reimagined in a rather clever way. In ordinary cars, such a system usually works with rubber bump stops that the suspension coil crashes against over bumps at the top and bottom of wheel travel. The progressive hydraulic cushion setup replaces these stops with hydraulic dampers. These cushion those impacts over things like speed humps and tarmac tears and allow the fitment of softer springs and dampers, producing the exemplary ride quality that Citroen claims this car can deliver. It seems to work too. 
we wouldn't join the French brand in describing it as magic carpet-like. You need proper air suspension for that. But overall, this is still the best conventional springing setup we've tried, easing the car over pore surfaces and floating you from crest to crest in a way that makes the ride of some class competitors feel rather crude. Thick, quilted, advanced comfort front seats further embellish the feeling of Gaelic luxury. If Citroen could affordably combine all this with the forward-scanning camera technology that its parent company stumped up for with this model's DS7 SUV cousin, a setup that predicts and prepares for bumps before you reach them, you'd think that something really special might be possible. In this humbler C5 Aircross, though, we're left with a simpler passive damping solution that works well but is affected more than you'd hope by things like deeper potholes or the unwise fitment of over-large 19-inch wheel rims. Perhaps, though, that's the price you pay for getting a decent improvement in ride comfort without the corresponding payback of an SUV that handles like a waterbed through the corners. This Citroen doesn't do that, but predictably it does roll more than its rivals if you push on through the turns with any kind of real vigour. If you can ignore this, there's actually more grip and traction than you'd think, though the somewhat over-light electric steering does its best to disguise the fact. It's better, though, to throttle back and drive with more Gaelic decorum. Enthusiasts won't be buying this car anyway. Only folk who want a lower pulse rate, not a faster one. For these people, the EAT8 8-speed ASIN developed automatic gearbox that will most typically be specified with this car will be perfect, efficiently slurring its way between the ratios in a manner that suits this C5's relaxed gait. It has to be fitted here because the version we're trying has the Stellantis Group plug-in hybrid powertrain that won't work with a manual stick shift, but which requires enough of a price premium to make you want to look at some of the more conventional engines first. There are two of these, both still lacking the mild hybrid tech that features on many rivals and both offering 130 horsepower. Either the brand's usual PureTech 1.2-litre three-cylinder petrol unit or the equally familiar 1.5-litre blue HDI diesel, which still sells well with this car, despite the current zeitgeist. Both will take you to 62 miles an hour in around 10 and a half seconds, on the way to a top speed of around 120. But, as before, the diesel's extra 70 newton metres of pulling power will give it a decisive towing advantage. Both combustion variants can be optionally ordered with a grip control system which offers grippier tyres, hill descent control and selectable mud, snow and sand modes to help through slippy situations. None of this is able to make this car into any kind of mud plugger, but in combination with a useful 230 millimetres of ground clearance, it is all enough to potentially make light forest tracks easily passable. And of course, equipped with grip control, this Citroen would be a good deal more capable in a snowy snap than most of its competitors. If, as is highly likely, neither towing or slippery surface prowess are priorities for you in choosing a C5 Aircross, then, if funds permit, your variant of choice would probably be this plug-in hybrid version. At the time of this test, this PHEV hadn't received any engineering updates, but its EV driving range has gradually risen since launch, now EAER rated at 38 miles. Provided, of course, that you don't regularly approach the claimed EV top speed of 84 miles an hour. Unlike in a Peugeot 3008 hybrid, this Citroen can't offer this powertrain with the option of four-wheel drive, but otherwise it's much the same as you'll find in many other Stellantis Group models. Which means a 1.6-litre petrol PureTech unit paired with a 110 HP electric motor powered by a 300-volt, 13.2-kilowatt-hour lithium-ion battery pack. There are three driving modes and none of them like being rushed or used aggressively. You'll almost always stay with the hybrid one that combines battery motion and engine power as the software thinks fit. The other settings are battery only electric for town use and engine only sport, which is what you'll need to replicate the claimed performance figures. 0 to 62 miles an hour is 8.7 seconds en route to 140 miles an hour. This hybrid model can't be had with that grip control system, but it isn't completely without off-road prowess. 
Citroen claims that all C5 Aircross variants would prove to be slightly more capable than rivals in the unlikely event that you ever ventured into the desert. The progressive hydraulic cushion suspension package was originally developed there to help Citroen's Paris Dakar rally cars better absorb the impacts of sand dune strewn tracks. Aircross owners, though, will want to leave the wilderness stuff to bare grills and enjoy the things that this car does rather better. Cruising comfortably at higher speeds is one of them, thanks to impressive standards of refinement, aided by the standard acoustic windscreen. If that's the kind of mileage your C5 Aircross will regularly engage in and you can afford to buy in at the top of the range, you'll be able to make use of a highway driver assist system, which is Citroen's best current attempt at so-called level two driving autonomy. This setup automatically regulates your speed, your position on the road, and your distance to the vehicle in front, though you have to keep your hands on the wheel at all times and your wits about you as the car will quickly revert full control back to you when road markings become less than clear. So where does all this leave us? With a premier class mid-sized SUV as promised? If you prioritise the things this Citroen does best, you may well think so. And even if you don't, you'll appreciate the fact that this car has tried to provide something dynamically different. As a Citroen always should. If you found the look of the original C5 Aircross slightly quirky, then you might appreciate what Citroen describes as the stronger, more elegant look of this updated version. A little less family, a little more premium, which is just as well, given the restructured pricing. You'll have already spotted that virtually all the significant visual changes lie here at the front with its reinterpreted central double chevron badging positioned below the high-set clamshell bonnet. Look carefully and you'll see more little chevrons integrated neatly into both upper and lower grills. The V-shaped LED daytime running light signature gives the front lights higher tech 3D effect, while this lower aluminium skid plate and these vertical corner intakes supply a more assertive vibe. From the side, you're reminded that this C5 Aircross is a five-seat design, but quite a large one. The 4.5 metre length leaves it a fraction bigger than the Stellantis Group's two other Gaelic-derived contenders in this class, Vauxhall's Grandland and the Peugeot 3008, but a fraction smaller than that conglomerate's seven-seat SUV offerings in this segment, the Peugeot 5008 and the DS7. As before, the most striking profile feature is this chrome C-pillar that wraps around the rear side window and aims to emphasise this design's spacious interior. The colour personalised panels that Citroen's dispense with at the front are still available here in dark chrome, anodised bronze, glossy black or anodised blue, surrounding the most forward-facing of these so-called air bumps on the lower side sill, which are supposed to protect the side of the car from low-speed parking bumps and scrapes. Update improvements are restricted to these smartly redesigned 18-inch diamond-cut Pulsar wheels with 19 inches at the top of the range and the matte black inserts fitted to these gloss black roof bars. Changes at the rear are limited to the smoked lenses added to these 3D LED tail lights, which offer a distinctively high-tech nighttime illuminated signature. Vents in the spoiler aim to emphasize the smooth aerodynamics. You get them too in the deep black bumper, which features these chrome effect exhausts. All this dressing's there, of course, to hide the fact that there's nothing really very different about the engineering here which sees this car ride on the same light, strong EMP2 platform used in various ways by the four other Stellantis Group mid-sized SUVs we mentioned earlier. Time to take a seat inside. Where the cabin certainly feels more modern and sophisticated than before, though not too much has actually changed. 
The main differences are found on the centre stack, where the unusual buttress-like vertical vents that used to flank the previously rather small 8-inch central infotainment screen have been banished to make way for this larger 10-inch monitor now sighted on top of horizontal vents that, sadly for a Citroen, look a good deal more conventional. Overall, though, given the need to base the whole cabin on existing hardware, Citroen's designers have done pretty well to give it such an air of individuality. Around the dash, black leather effect material and chrome touches move the ambience of this facelifted model up market. And for the auto versions most customers will choose, there's now a smaller e-toggle gear selector. As before, the aspect of this interior we most like is found with the generously proportioned advanced comfort front seats. They feature particularly broad bases, foam that's 15 millimeters thicker than usual for extra support, plus extra quilted padding to create an inviting visual signature that doesn't disappoint once you squish yourself into place. There's standard lumbar support too, the headrests look a bit of an afterthought and there's not much side support, but otherwise these pews brilliantly replicate the kind of feeling of cosseting Gallic luxury that affordable Citroens of the 60s and 70s used to offer. Colour coordinated stitching across the seat base edge and the shoulder line add a smart finishing touch. In comparison, the front chairs you get in rivals are dull and unyielding. Here you'll really notice a difference. Seats aside, as with most modern Citroens, what you get here is a mixture of interesting design. Voluptuous curves, little stitched design details, faux leather trimming, piano black detailing and so on. And some rather cheap plastic finishes, reminding you that you haven't stumped up for a premium brand model in this segment. Fortunately though, your attention's diverted away from cost-cutting compromises by the kind of lovely design detailing you probably wouldn't think you'd find at this price point. This stitched strap on the passenger side fascia panel and this lovely faux leather cowl on top of the instrument binnacle, for instance. The little touches of chrome and lacquered black trim are nice, and even the stitched door cards with their air bump style indentation finishing look stylish and distinctive. We mentioned the instrument binnacle. It's another cabin talking point, the C5 Aircross having been one of the first cars in its segment to replace conventional dials with a fully configurable and customizable standard color screen, which in this case is 12.3 inches in size. Five different display modes, minimum, dials, driving, navigation, and personal, are accessed via a roller switch on the left-hand side of the steering wheel, but there's no option for the kind of full screen mapping that you get in a rival Volkswagen Group product. Still, everything else here works pretty well. Visual priority can be given to speed readouts, navigation mapping or driving safety features. Or you can choose to view only the absolute minimum of information if all that gives you a headache. It's a bit annoying though that dials don't actually give you any dials, just more square boxes. Whatever setting you've opted for, a button press at the end of this right-hand steering column stalk also delivers trip computer information onto the left-hand side of the screen. Just about everything else you'll need to know can be found on the aforementioned freshly installed centre infotainment touchscreen. We told you earlier it was 10 inches in size, but it might as well not be because this monitor's main display area is always flanked on either side by broad temperature readouts, which don't actually allow you to select temperature, but instead connect you through to a separate climate screen of options. Still, at least there's now a decent selection of shortcut climate buttons in the middle of the centre stack, so you don't have to keep changing the screen format every time you want to alter temperature or fan speed. The display graphics are now better too, and everything you really need is incorporated, including my Citroen Drive navigation, plus Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. But the software that drives it all isn't much different, and the screen itself could do with being angled more towards the driver. Cabin storage offers another Citroen-esque mixture of beautifully crafted design and frustrating finishing. We really like this intricately stitched twin lidded storage box between the seats, which incorporates a lift-out oddments tray 
and has illumination, you'll need because the deeper part extends right forward below these twin cup holders, which in a nice touch are also illuminated. But why aren't there any connectivity ports in this storage area that would allow you to charge your phone away from prying eyes? And why, as usual on Citroens from this era, is the glove box capacity massively compromised by the vehicle's fuse box? Why is there no overhead compartment for your sunglasses? And why did the deep door pockets not include bottle holders? You'd think that these would all be relatively easy things to fix. On the plus side, there's a big open cubby in front of the gear selector with a 12 volt socket and two USB-A ports, an open stowage by the driver's right knee and ticket clips on the sun visors. There aren't really any other issues unless on a manual model you object to the rather high placement of the gear stick. Aside from that, the driving position is great not only because of those squashy seats but also because you're afforded the kind of reasonably commanding view out that it's not now possible to take for granted on a fashion-led SUV these days. All-round visibility is good, but just in case, all-round parking sensors are standard across the range, as is a rear-view camera too. Time to take a seat in the rear. If you're lifting things like child seats in and out, you'll be glad of this model's high roof height and wide opening doors. Once inside, the key thing to note is what Citroen rightly claims to be the most modular reach bench arrangement in the class, by which they mean an MPV-like format of three individual seats rather than the usual bench with an uncomfortably raised middle section. This is another of the things that might really sell us this car. The three seats can individually recline in five positions from 19 through to 26 and a half degrees and slide back and forth over a range of 150 millimeters to improve either rear luggage space or legroom. Impressively, that functionality extends to this hybrid model, which stores its battery below the floor here. Not that you really need to improve legroom. That generous four and a half meter body length means that there's plenty, vastly more room than something in this class like a Qashqai or an Attica, and usefully more space than larger segment contenders like Ford's Cougar as well. What you actually might require though is a touch more headroom, at least in the car fitted out with Citroen's huge panoramic glass top. The roof itself is nice to have, measuring an impressive 1,120mm by 840mm and flooding the cabin with light, but the ceiling height reduction it brings with it does mean that taller folk will find themselves brushing the headlining, so we're glad we don't have that here. Of more importance is the fact that this is one of the only models in the segment in which the middle seat occupant won't feel as if they've drawn the short straw on longer trips. That's partly because of this particularly low centre transmission tunnel, but mainly because these three individual seats are of equal width as they would be in an MPV. That means you don't get a centre armrest, of course, which annoyingly means you can't have any cup holders back here, but in compensation, there are seat back pockets, decently sized door bins, twin central vents, overhead lights, and a central USB port, all provided for your traveling comfort. Not everything's great. The door bins are difficult to get at when the door's closed, and the headrests are of the type that can dig uncomfortably into the back of your shoulder until they're raised. And out back, well, on our way to the boot, we'll once again reference the fact that Citroen hasn't felt it necessary to offer a seven-seat option in this sector, even though it's only fractionally shorter than other class contenders who do. But that at least means that you should be able to expect a generously sized boot, so let's see. The tailgate's easy to lift up, so you don't really need the electric operation we've got here. Something only supplied as standard right at the top of the range, complete with functionality that can be activated with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper if you find yourself approaching the car laden down with bags. Once the hatch is raised, you're faced with a large boot 
that'll be 580 litres with a conventionally engine model or 460 litres for a hybrid variant like this. That's a fraction more than the equivalent versions of this car's Peugeot 3008 cousin can offer. Plus that model, like most SUVs in the class, can't be specified with a rear bench. You can slide forward to improve things. Do that in a C5 Aircross, and if you don't mind giving your rear seat occupants city car standards of legroom, your luggage capacity will rise to 720 litres with a conventionally engine model, or 600 litres with this hybrid variant. To give you some sort of class perspective, a Ford Cougar gives you a maximum of only 526 litres of space and a Nissan Qashqai only 500 litres. So no, all mid-sized SUVs aren't the same. Getting to the stowage area means negotiating this rather high loading lip, but with conventionally engined models, a standard adjustable height boot floor has been designed in, though sadly, you can't have that with this hybrid variant. Even with this plug-in model though, you get an underfloor stowage compartment for the charging cable. For effective use of the trunk space, there are tie-down points onto which a luggage net can be clipped, plus there's a 12-volt socket. Bag hooks have been omitted though, as have seat retraction sidewall catches. The latter wouldn't be too much of an issue if you could, as usual, reach forward and release the rear bench through the normal seat shoulder catches, but annoyingly, they're missing as well. Which means that to push down the seat backs, you have the faff of walking round to the side of the car and pulling on the little straps provided with each individual seat. On the plus side, the three-way equal split means that you can, if necessary, just push forward the centre chair, allowing you to easily transport longer items like skis without disturbing a couple of rear-seated passengers. Talking of long items, another thing Citroen hasn't thought to provide is a fold-flat front passenger seat option. The brand thinks that with up to 1.9 metres of cargo length on offer, you shouldn't need that, perhaps. The total capacity figure certainly shouldn't disappoint, up to 1,630 litres of space being on offer from the flat seats retracted cargo area. It's 1,510 litres with this hybrid model. So let's get to the pricing, which from launch and at the time of this test was pitched in the 27 to £33,000 bracket for mainstream models. Pretty much what you'd expect these days for a family-shaped mid-sized SUV with cutting-edge design and a front-driven only model lineup. This hybrid version's a little more, of course. At the time of this test, Citroen was charging in the 36 to £38,000 bracket for one of these. As for trimming choices, well, there's no really Spartan spec level, so bear that in mind when price matching against some apparently much cheaper segment alternatives. And there's no irrelevantly sporty top model either. Instead, C5 Aircross buyers are offered three pretty middle-of-the-road trim choices. Sense Plus, this mid-range Shine spec, or top C-series edition. The most affordable 130 horsepower conventionally engine variants come with a choice of two engines, both available with optional EAT8 auto transmission if you're willing to stump up the rather steep couple of thousand pound premium. If your annual mileage is quite low, then Citroen's impressively efficient three-cylinder 1.2-litre PureTech turbo petrol unit might be all you really need. The conventional alternative is the 1.5-litre blue HDI diesel variant. The premium to go from 1.2-litre petrol power to the base diesel is £1,000. Avoid entry-level trim and the range widens to include the front-driven 1.6-litre petrol plug-in hybrid auto-only powertrain that we're trying here. From a Citroen range perspective, C5 Aircross pricing represents a premium of around £4,000 over the next SUV down in the company's range, the C3 Aircross. There'd be a price jump of around £3,000 if you were graduating to this car from an equivalent version of the brand's more ordinary but still slightly crossover-orientated C4 hatch. 
On to the value proposition that Citroen's pricing represents in the mid-sized SUV market. In assessing that, we should probably start with this model's two closest sister designs, Peugeot's 3008 and Vauxhall's Grandland, since under the skin all three cars are pretty much the same. Comparing prices between these three contenders is difficult because the spec levels are differently orientated, but it's difficult to escape the conclusion that this Citroen model is significantly better value, not only because it's slightly bigger, but also because it incorporates, as standard, the useful sliding and reclining three individual seat arrangements you can't have on those two other cars. For reference, base spec to base spec with the volume 130 badged petrol and diesel models, a Grandland will typically cost you around £500 more than this C5 Aircross. A 3008 with the same engine will typically cost you around £2,500 more. It's probable, though, that the cars in this class you're more likely to be considering as an alternative will be the ones that many of the magazines will point you to in the family-orientated mid-sized SUV segment. Nissan's Qashqai and Seat's Attica both handle a little more sharply than this Citroen, and the Nissan is around £1,000 cheaper. Though, if you equalised spec with the base version of this Citroen, that increment would disappear. The Attica costs around £1,500 more. Two of the other key contenders in this class are Korean. The Kia Sportage, think about £1,000 more, and the Hyundai Tucson, think about £2,000 more. What else is there in the main part of the five-seat mid-sized SUV volume brand segment? Nothing else that rides like this Citroen, for sure. Think in terms of needing around £1,000 more for a Škoda Karok, around £2,000 more for a Mini Countryman or a Mazda CX-5, and around £3,000 more for an equivalent Ford Cougar or Volkswagen Tiguan. Not everything in the class is more expensive. An MG HS could save you up to £4,000, and a Sangyong Corando up to around £5,000. But again, it'd be much less than that if you equalised spec, and both of those two models would cost you a lot more to run. Lots of options then in the mid-sized SUV class. If we haven't mentioned the one you've been thinking of as an alternative, there are various reasons why. It may be that the mid-sized crossover contender you have in mind doesn't really have a comparable engine, like the Jeep Compass, the Lexus UX, the Honda CR-V, and the Toyota RAV4, which are all full hybrids. Or it might be that the car you have in mind isn't really comparable because it's based on a stretched version of a smaller super mini platform. So, of course, will probably be significantly cheaper, but quite cramped inside, like a Honda HRV, a Suzuki S-Cross, an Audi Q2, or a Volkswagen T-Roc. Or we may have omitted the mid-sized SUV you have in mind because it has a premium badge. So it won't be directly comparable because it's significantly more expensive, like a Mercedes GLA, a Volvo XC40, an Audi Q3, Jaguar E-Pace or a BMW X1. Or maybe the mid-sized SUV in question might be more expensive because it non-negotiably must be had with four-wheel drive, like Subaru's XV. A word also about the separate value proposition of this plug-in hybrid version. Compared to the identically engineered Vauxhall Grandland and Peugeot 3008 front-driven plug-in hybrids, it's about £1,000 more than the Vauxhall, but around £1,500 less than the Peugeot. A Volkswagen Tiguan e-hybrid would cost around £1,000 more and a Ford Cougar PHEV around £1,500 more. Plug-in versions of the Kia Sportage and Hyundai Tucson are priced are still around £40,000 because they only come in four-wheel drive PHEV form. Lots of alternatives then, whichever C5 Aircross model you happen to fancy. We can see plenty of people though deciding this Citroen to be one of the most appealing of them. If that's your perspective, then you're going to need to know just how generous the brand has been when it comes to standard equipment. Well, let's see. All versions get the brand's softly supportive progressive hydraulic cushion suspension and much else too, though as usual you'll have to avoid base trim to get the real niceties. 
That base trim level, as mentioned earlier, is Sense Plus spec. And to be fair, as referenced earlier, this includes a reasonable amount by class standards. Even at this level in the range, C5 Aircross buyers can expect 18-inch diamond-cut Pulsar alloy wheels, front fog lamps, keyless entry, rear privacy glass, an acoustic windscreen, all-round parking sensors, roof rails and power folding mirrors. You can also tick off 3D rear lights, magic wash integrated windscreen wipers, cruise control, an alarm and also headlamps and wipers. For Sense Plus spec, the air curtain and air bump inserts are glossy black. Move inside and you'll find supportive advanced comfort seats and soft LED interior lighting, plus three individual sliding and reclining seats at the back. Along with dual zone climate control, a 12.3 inch TFT digital instrument binnacle display, a reversing camera, lumbar adjustment for the driver's seat, and also dimming rear view mirror, aluminium pedals, and on the conventionally engined models, a two position boot floor. The 10 inch centre dash capacitive touchscreen includes My Citroen Drive navigation, a six speaker DAB audio system, Bluetooth, and a mirror screen media connectivity function. This allows you to duplicate your phone handset's display onto the center dash monitor, the setup supporting the MirrorLink system for Android devices and Apple CarPlay for iPhones. Sense Plus trim gives you what Citroen calls its wild black cabin package with black fabric and leather effect cloth. Most C5 Aircross buyers in this country, though, will find the £1,000 premium that Citroen asks to trade up to the mid-range shine spec we've got here. Models of this grade recognisable by the dark chrome finish applied to the side air curtains and air bumps. And inside by the nicer urban black interior ambience pack, which mixes black Alcantara with leather effect cloth. Shine spec also gives you six-way driver's seat adjustment, acoustic laminated side window glass, stainless steel door sills and carpet mats. And at this level in the range, you get some key drive assist features, which we'll brief you on shortly. At top C-Series edition level, the C5 Aircross is set apart by larger Art 19-inch wheels and an anodized bronze finish for the air curtains and air bumps. Plus, you get the contrast-colored roof, Power tailgate and panoramic glass roof that are all optional at shine level. The C-Series Edition interior is set apart by Citroen's Metropolitan Black Ambience Pack, which gives you upholstery in black Claudia leather with leather effect cloth. Quite a lot of kit then, but there's still space on the spec sheet for lots of extras. We'd argue that with the conventionally engined models, the key option box to tick is that for the grip control traction control system. This package measures out traction for the front wheels in slippery conditions in a way that's tailored to different types of terrain. Plus, it includes grippier tyres and hill assist descent control. While it may not be really necessary for most of us to have fully fledged four wheel drive on a crossover of this kind, neither do most of us want to pay the premium for an SUV, then be left slithering about like everyone else when the weather turns icy. That's where grip control comes in. That apart, probably the first thing you're going to want to do is to get the look of this car right. Bear in mind that unless you want your C5 Aircross finished in flat polar white or cumulus grey on the C-Series edition, you're going to need to pay your dealer extra for one of the optional metallic or pearlescent paint colours. We've got Eclipse Blue Metallic here. Having decided that, you're going to need to fix on the colour-coded finishing you want for the side air curtains and air bump panels. With Base Sense Plus trim, you can pay extra to have these finished in dark chrome or anodized blue. And with the top two trim levels, you can have all the various shades as no-cost options. On to safety. Now, as you'd expect, there are all the usual things, twin front, side and curtain airbags, ISOFIX child seat fastenings and the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction and stability control. In addition, you'll want to know about the cutting edge electronic radar driven stuff and there's plenty of it. All versions of this Citroen get autonomous braking, an active safety brake system that detects hazards ahead and will apply the brakes if the driver 
doesn't react. Incorporated into this setup is forward collision warning, which alerts you if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front. There's also an active lane departure warning system that'll alert you if you drift out of lane on the highway, then applying subtle steering pressure to ease you back to where you ought to be. That's just the start though. All versions of this C5 Aircross also come with coffee break alert, which after two hours of driving at over 40 miles an hour alerts you to take a restorative break. And there's speed limit recognition, which pictures speed signs as you pass and displays them on the dash. This can link to an intelligent speed adaptation system, which suggests the recognized speed limits to the car's standard speed limiter. More important still is the standard Citroen Connect box emergency and assistance system, a package that will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact location if the airbags go off. Avoid base spec and you get Citroen's Drive Assist Pack, which gives you more. First up is adaptive cruise control with a stop and go function, which on an auto model can use a radar to automatically regulate your cruising distance to the vehicle in front at motorway speeds, even to the extent of stopping, then seamlessly starting off again if necessary. Then there are intelligent beam headlights, which will automatically dip themselves for you at night. Driver attention alert, which constantly monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness and active blind spot monitoring will stop you from pulling out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. C-Series Edition models with automatic transmission also get Citroen's Highway Driver Assist System which is the closest the brand can currently get to any kind of autonomous driving setup. In highway driving, it automatically regulates your speed, your position on the road, and your distance from the vehicle in front. Though you have to keep your hands on the wheel at all times and your wits about you as the car will quickly revert full control back to you when road markings become less than clear. Under the skin, the mechanicals of this facelifted model are unchanged from those of the original version, which means they're still shared with the Stellantis Group's other five-seat mid-sized SUVs, the Peugeot 3008 and the Vauxhall Grandland, including the sophisticated EMP2 platform and all the engines. Most buyers will be selecting between the two 130 horsepower units, both available with a smooth shifting E88 eight speed auto transmission that really suits this car. As before, the range kicks off with the brand's usual 1.2 litre three cylinder PureTech petrol power plant, which in manual manages up to 49.5 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 140 grams per kilometre of CO2. Towers will prefer the torquier alternative 1.5 litre blue HDI 130 diesel. In this case though, we're trying the plug-in hybrid model, which sees a 1.6 litre PureTech petrol unit paired with a 110 horsepower electric motor powered by a 300 volt, 13.2 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack. At the time of this test, this PHEV hadn't received any engineering updates, but its EV driving range has gradually risen since launch, now EAER rated at 38 miles. We're used to modern Citroens being rather light by class standards, particularly models that are like this one, built upon the PSA Group stiff, sophisticated EMP2 platform. So the news that the fastest and best equipped conventionally engined versions of this C5 Aircross tip the scales at well over one and a half tonnes may prepare you for the fact that in trading up from the brand's smaller C3 Aircross model, which is a massive 400 kilos lighter, your running cost returns are going to be very different. Of course, many C5 Aircross buyers won't be switching from something smaller in the crossover class, and these people will merely be happy to see that this car's efficiency stats number amongst the better readings that you can expect to get from a mid-sized volume brand SUV of this kind. We'll start with the returns possible from the base 1.2 litre PureTech 130 petrol power plant, which is supposed to be able to manage up to 49.5 mpg on the combined cycle, and up to 140 grams per kilometre of CO2, or 46.7 mpg and 147 grams per kilometre as an auto. 
which we'll put into perspective by telling you that a directly comparable 1.5 litre petrol Ford Cougar can only manage up to 42.8 mpg and 149 grams per kilometre. Other rivals get closer than that, but there aren't many that can beat Citroen's showing here, which is important if you're changing into a family SUV from a conventional family hatch and want to reduce the efficiency downside of your switch. If that's the case, it's probably more likely that you'll be considering the other volume 130 spec C5 Aircross model, the 1.5 litre blue HDI variant, provided that you're not put off by diesel tax disincentives. For a manual version of this derivative, the figures are up to 60.8 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 129 grams per kilometre of CO2. The 1.5 blue HDI auto variant we'd recommend does nearly as well, managing up to 57.8 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 136 grams per kilometre of CO2. Few rivals can better that showing in this segment. These figures aided on conventional models by a provided Eco Plus button on the lower centre console which restricts throttle travel and the output of the air conditioner. Of course, if you're really interested in efficiency, then if running costs permit, you'll be wanting to focus on the plug-in hybrid variant we're trying here. In our driving section, we briefed you on its powertrain, a 1.6-litre combustion petrol unit paired with a 110-horsepower electric motor powered by a 13.2-kilowatt-hour lithium-ion battery pack. When fully charged, that allows this car to travel around 38 miles between charges. That's not quite enough to achieve the 8% benefiting kind tax liability you can have with some PHEV rivals. But this Citroen's 12% BIK figure is of course a world away from the BIK ratings applied to other C5 Aircross variants, between 30 and 35%. The combined cycle fuel figure of up to 222.3 mpg is as pie in the sky as it usually is with PHEVs. Think in reality in terms of the sort of returns you get from the diesel and you won't be too far out. This hybrid variant can be recharged in 2 hours 20 minutes from a 7 kilowatt 32 amp wall box and features an e-save function allowing the driver to reserve electrical energy for planned routes ahead. Say the town driving you might have to do at the end of a long motorway journey. E-Save is one of the functions you get from the EV driving section of the screen, accessible via this lightning designated button to the left of the volume knob. The other available sections are Flow and Energy Flow Monitor, Statistics, Energy Consumption Graphs and Charging. There's also a Charge Eco Power Meter in the instrument binnacle. Of course, running costs are about a lot more than just fuel economy and CO2 readings, so what else are you going to need to know? Well, service intervals for all engines are every 20,000 miles or once a year, whichever comes first. So you can budget ahead, the French manufacturer offers its Citroën maintenance scheme that lets you pay either a one-off fee or monthly instalments to cover the cost of the routine upkeep of your car for as long as three years and 35,000 miles. Every C5 Aircross comes with a three-year and 60,000 mile warranty. The first two years of that aren't subject to any mileage limits, but the third year, which is taken care of by your local dealer, is limited to 60,000 miles. There's also Europe-wide breakdown assistance included from you for the first year you own the car. Looking at the longer term, you also have a 12-year guarantee against rust and 36 months cover for any paintwork defects, though that doesn't include stone chips and other wear and tear damage. Residual values are also going to be key to whole life running costs. Industry experts CAP offer a predicted figure for this car of up to 49% after a typical three year, 30,000 mile period. The same as you'd get for a comparable Peugeot 3008. Only Kia's Sportage betters that amongst the volume brands in this segment. Go for something like a Nissan Qashqai or a Ford Cougar and you'll be looking at getting 6 to 7% less than that for your car at the end of your ownership period. What else? Well, the insurance? Let's finish by guiding you through the groupings. 19E for all the combustion models and 28E for this hybrid.
In an SUV market as crowded as this one, any mainstream product simply has to bring something different to the table. Fortunately, this C5 Aircross has. It's progressive hydraulic cushion suspension delivering a noticeable ride quality advantage over obvious rivals. Some of these handle better, but we think the way that this Citroen cruises over bumps and tarmac tears will be of more interest to likely family buyers. This car's emphasis on comfort won't endear it to magazine road testers or people who, rather mystifyingly, want their family SUV to handle with sporting sharpness. And there are cheaper cars in the mid-sized crossover class and contenders that might tempt you with classier cabins or an extra row of seats. But if you can look beyond all that, there's much here to like beyond the cosseting ride. The spacious interior, the versatile back seat arrangement and charismatic finishing touches are all showroom selling points, even if the upgraded infotainment system still isn't. Overall, though, the updates made to this much smarter facelifted model are welcome, but even so, it's likely that this Gallic SUV will still remain quite a rare sight on our roads. Citroen hopes the availability of the plug-in hybrid technology we've been trying here may get this car onto the radar of likely customers in the mid-sized family crossover segment. Maybe so. Anyway, it's refreshing to see this Gallic brand getting back to what it does best. This car stands out as a result, as it very much needs to.